So Nate is going to talk to us about Java deserialization, which sounds awesome, and I said that fine. I haven't drank enough tonight. Um, so Nate, talk to us about Java and pop some boxes and give us some zero days. Let's give Nate a big hand. Right, so this is Java deserialization and other bad things um, because uh, Java deserialization is awesome. Um, it's probably one of the first things I look for as a pen tester when I hop on a network now uh, to avoid detection by all the other people that are trying to catch me and figure out what it is the hell that I'm doing. So um, this is probably the scariest vulnerability that you didn't hear about um, because it's prevalent in a lot of repackaged software people that use JBoss, people that use Tomcat, people that pass, that pass serialized objects back around. You probably didn't hear about this. Um, if you did, it was in a select you know, uh, group of products. So anyway, but it's everywhere and you're almost bound to run across it if you're doing any app testing or anything else. So uh, deserialization is actually a whole class of vulnerabilities. Um, so for the common web exposures, uh, they uh, say... Eat the mic! <laughs> well, they told me this is a properly tuned mic. Eat the mic! <laughs> All right. Fantastic. So if the application deserializes untrusted data without sufficiently verifying that the resulting data will be valid, so that means you can send objects to a service that accepts serialized objects, and it'll be processed without pretty much any verification. Um, you can use crypto inside your objects if you want to protect them, um, but almost no one does. So the problem with Java deserialization is that uh, we have a bunch of assumptions from developers, uh, namely that uh, all these requests that are going to be coming to the service um, are trusted sources, and a lot of times they really aren't. Um, the other ones are, you know, typical developer speak, it's, oh, it's binary, nobody else can read it. And uh, some people, you know, they tokenize their request, so, oh, you can't get my token. Um, and nobody can create serialized objects, it's magic. And uh, our world is all rainbows and sunshine. So, we well, can see what happened to rainbows. All right, so, you ever seen something like this fly through burp? Um, that is a job to serialized object. So if you look up there at the content type header, I'm sorry for the people that are sitting in the back. Um, it says uh, application X Java serialized object. And that is exactly what we're looking for. So what about something like this? Ever seen one of those? That's also a Java serialized object because it's just a base 64 encoded version of a Java serialized object. So, but you can always spot them because you always notice the R00 capital A capital B in the front of it because when you base 64 encode it, um, these first four are pretty much always the same. And so it'll always result in those first four characters appearing that way. Um, so this is a tool that was written by a, a couple gentlemen um, that uh, will produce nasty um, serialized objects that you can pass to all these services. Um, so here's how we use YSO Serial to create a nasty serialized object, and you can pretty much execute whatever you feel like doing. Um, you just tuck your OS commands there in between the single ticks, uh, put that into a file, um, because there's going to be some non-printable characters in there and you're going to need to recycle that later. And here's how you can find a JBoss instance that's vulnerable as hell. Um, you can just use a browser to scan for this, literally. You can check for this URI, and if it responds to you with that, it responds to you with an object, then you know that it's vulnerable. That's pretty much it. So you don't even have to do vuln scans. You just look for that. So this is uh, extreme JBoss ownage um, with Burp. Um, and you'll notice like in the bottom part, we got like a bunch of crazy looking <clears throat> stuff at the bottom there. That's a uh, PowerShell calling a uh, base64 encoded payload and uh, I'm pretty sure that that's an Empire payload um, and if you guys aren't using Empire and are a red team or a pen tester then you're really missing out um, because uh, Empire is amazing um, all PowerShell non-memory I mean it's all in memory doesn't get rid of the disk doesn't get seen by antivirus anything like that 
So we like to wedge Empire stubs and pretty much wherever we can, um, a full interpreter shell doing the callback and everything tends to get caught by some of the advanced endpoint protection, you know, semantic, stuff like that. So we don't even bother with that. We usually just do Empire shells now. Um, so the other one um, is a Java RMI service, so the remote, remote method invocation. Um, it's kind of like RBC, except using serialized Java classes to do so. Um, uses JRMP. Um, it's inherently vulnerable since it, its primary method of communication is Java serialized objects. So if you see this service on the network, you're pretty much going to own it. It's, it's going to happen. So when it, it, uh, it's remarkably similar to the paved stones that were used for constructing the pathway to hell, which we all know was paved with good intentions. So it's super easy to own RMI. Um, using Wasa Serial, uh, you just do you know, Java CP, all that good stuff, your host name, the port that uh, your RMI service is listening on. Um, the comments collections one is the method that you want to use to try and escape and achieve command execution. Um, so they have in the newer Wasa Serial packages, it keeps evolving because they keep finding new vectors for command execution across many different platforms. So you've got your spring, you've got you know, one version of Java that had a terrible implementation of something, you know. So there's one, two, three, four, five of just the commons collections libraries. And then there's other ones that are typically included in other applications. So Java View Serialization, it's awesome. I typically look for it before I look for anything else because I don't have to do a full Nessa scan. I don't have to do a Vault scan. I don't have to do anything else. I just look out and I see what's out there. I try and find JBoss servers, stuff like that. So you see in the HTTP part, and there's your handy inmap command to find all that good stuff. And uh, here's your handy inmap command to find all the RMI servers. And uh, there's many others. Um, so I just popped uh, Semantic Endpoint Protection Manager, I think, uh, three weeks ago. Um, it was on a client that had this many servers. Um, and one of them was running the Semantic Endpoint Protection Manager. And so we injected some commands into that and it was real fun. So this happened. I was just doing my regular pen testing things and I found something listening on 1099. So I exploited it and I got one of these. Um, but as somebody once said, Shell was only the beginning. So we decided to go a little bit farther down the rabbit hole and start looking around once we actually compromised the box. So that's new. Um, I don't think anybody found that one yet. Um, so the Java RMI service on SolarWinds Virtualization Manager um, before version 6.3.1 with a hotfix that they just released um, is vulnerable to what I just showed you on the Java RMI attack. Um, you're locked into a low-privileged user, but uh, that was pretty much defeated by doing that. <laughs> so after we had root, um, it was kind of just scouring the file system, trying to find stuff, and we actually did find a sweet upgrade shell script, and there was some awesome stuff tucked in there, and that was Postgres SQL commands with credentials. So I issued those same commands and uh, dumped everything to a file. And uh, then there was some really good stuff in there, which was namely a uh, username and password with domain creds. So all the way over to the right, that little, that little tiny blur over there is the domain name. I'm sorry, client confidentiality. So, uh, but the, uh, the domain creds themselves, the password part was actually encrypted. So we went looking again and uh, we just grabbed the WAR file for the application uh, that was hanging in user share Tomcat web apps. And uh, then we looked at those with JDGUI. Um, if you guys haven't used JDGUI um, to look at stuff, it's amazing. And if you didn't know, a WAR file is just a zip file. So you just unzip the stuff, and then you can go look at the individual jar files that are inside of the WAR with JDGUI, and it'll just show you the code. So we went and found a, uh, we went and found a function that uh, said credential decrypt. And uh, so you had a reference to the uh, encryption util.decrypt function. So we went and found that function. And uh, 
Yes, that is DES encryption with a static key, folks. Like that still exists today. So uh, this is the function that actually decrypts the database contents when you're trying to rip something out or if it's trying to use those credentials that are in the database to access some of these other virtual machines that this thing manages. And uh, I had somebody whip up, because um, I pretty much knew what I had at that point. I said, you know, this is the function that decrypts things from the database. So that stuff that I snagged from that SQL dump, I could probably pipe it into this and get what I'm after. So big shout out to Ryan Preston, otherwise known as X Games. Um, and so I shot him the hash, and uh, he pulled all this stuff into Eclipse and uh, wrote a very small um, Java program, which I'm really ashamed that I didn't write, but I kind of suck at Java, so that's all right. I got about seven other languages, but Java's not one of them. So, but uh, big props to Preston on, uh, on busting that out. He had it done in like five minutes, and I felt really stupid. So, and that happened after he ran that program. And uh, because of what the appliance actually does, um, it goes out and manages virtual machines, checks in with them, everything else. These were actually domain AMM and creds. So those could be recycled and used to you know, further compromise everything. So anyway, that's pretty much it. I want to thank uh, Gabriel Lawrence, Chris Froroff, um, Steve Green, Brian Alexander, and especially Act Games. Um, this talk came out a long time ago in 2015 and nobody really paid attention to it until the guys from Fox Club picked it up and I noticed the article and I was just like, wow, this is super serious. And there actually is a burp extension called Super Serial. So, but uh, thanks to SolarWinds um, because they actually did respond to me. They worked with me. They fixed almost all the stuff that I found. And this is just a small portion of what I found. Um, I reported to them probably nine different issues, and they did fix all of them, but I went back and forth with MITRE about what constituted a, a CVE and what was acceptable encryption and things like that, and I just didn't have the time to jack with them. Um, so the big ones are covered in the two CVEs that are there, but there were other issues, and they did fix all of them. So, And uh, if you found this interesting, and uh, if you would like to do this kind of thing, or you would like to do that kind of thing, uh, get with me or one of my team because we can always use more people that like to do this kind of stuff. So we're all on the back table right there. Just look for that very tall, bald gentleman. So anyway, have fun.